Most of the young ones feel that uh, there is far, far better life uh, in Europe and in Americas. And that is why they normally won't go there. But uh, I think uh, this conference, when I read through the brochure, I saw that uh, it is very, very relevant. So that a, a relevant practical information will be given out so that uh, some of us, like the clergymen, we will be well equipped right. when we are counseling younger ones to let them know that there is uh, no better place than home because uh, going out there doing nothing just to suffer is better you learn a treat, you concentrate on whatever you are doing, and then progress here. That's so our, uh, 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 this conference to me is very, very uh, relevant. Thank you. by a center at the University of Ghana, two centers actually, and they had mentioned that in fact the number of people who have been exposed to COVID-19 should be around a million plus in Ghana. And so from their projections, a lot more people have been exposed to COVID. And then we went to town to find out from people and they were expressing their views. Some said, well, we should blame the politicians because we are all adhering to the protocols with, you know, religiosity. Only for them to be engaging in political rallies, no social distancing, and in some cases, people were not wearing those masks. And so I asked them, for example, so do you think we'll get to a point where, oh yes, I can wait? Do you suspect we could uh, be locked down again? And one lady said, well. It's possible there could be another lockdown, but that will only be after the elections. <laughs> after the election is done, we know who wins, then they will lock us down again. But I'm very happy to see that we are all in our nose masks. It gives me a lot of joy. And you would have noticed that there is a sanitizer out there. It's automatic, so just when you put your hands there, it helps you. You have a, a sanitizer to help yourself over there. And then if you went out and went straight ahead, you find that there was, uh, there's a restroom there and so you can help yourself. Oh, Every day in the mirror I see a woman Any time I look in my mind I see a woman A wonderful woman An African woman Mother of nature Yeah, yeah Beautiful woman Yeah, 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 yeah. I want 
to hear guys. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Usuku ni to waba pawate. O bedra ni ni to waba pawate. O shenke ni to waba pawate. O hiya ni iba to waba pawate. Nese woya dana ba to waba pawate. Bank manager to waba pawate. O gosi ni to waba pawate. Mm, mm, mm. I was here with a university where we serve a sire liability. We feel a fear for a kind of song top of human. Now, so, and yes, I want to pay human. Trending topic for Twitter today be Papa. No. But you know, they change the price of Papa. No. Tomorrow, then we'll talk about King Promise and how we know the fee to keep his promise. I find the quality now, so I'm going so I need you now, so what? Need you now, so what? Cause you got the power, to promote the power, make you know they forget to use your brain power. Before you go sell your power cheaply to some power, hungry person waiting for you tower. They watch you like TV. Yeah. The president of Ghana Union, Hamburg, Germany. Good morning. Government of Ghana delegations, ministers of Ghana churches and Islamic leaders in Ghana, members of diplomatic diplomatic community, press and all protocols duly observed. Ghana Union is an umbrella organization that exists for an estimated Ghanaian population of about 30,000 people in Hamburg. Ghana Union has been in existence since 1960. Ghana Union aims to protect every Ghanaian living in Hamburg. It also helps them in every difficulty that they might find themselves in. Ghana Union was selected among over 30 organizations after going through a competitive bidding process to undertake the Widow and the Hamburger Sparkasse projects. On that issue, later our General Secretary will brief you further or give more light to the projects. Every day, we encounter many Ghanaians seeking for assistance at our office in Hamburg. Chiefs among problems, among the problems is how to integrate in the society for those who have arrived and comes, uh, who has arrived and comes in for prospective uh, regions who struggle with the idea of returning home with nothing, one thing is clear, a significant number of Ghanaians who travel to Europe heavily rely on the micro-conception of Europe as a paradise. My myth of better life in Europe projects is a commitment to tackle the one-sided narrative that exists in Ghana for potential migrants. But importantly, we want to highlight the impact of social stigma back home that continues to keep our brothers and sisters living undignified, leaving ourselves and how to eradicate it. At the end of this conference, it is my belief that a more collated plan from the various stakeholders will drive a sustained discourse to promote regular migration and eradicate the stigma returnees encounter back home. I thank you and welcome you all again to this program.
thank you very much. And um, I'm actually honored that we have everybody here. Um, good morning to all everybody who um, honored our request. And um, I thank you all for coming. Um, so I would like to start why we have this Project Mobile, the myth of better life in Europe. And actually, it's, it started from my own story, moving from Ghana to Germany. And uh, sometimes my friends do ask me, Felix, you, you are a trained climate scientist. Why, why are you so concerned with the issue of migration? And um, actually, it stems from two moments in my life. When I was a kid, there was um, a man living in my neighborhood who was deported from um, Italy. And when he was deported from Italy, his own, his own family despised him off. He was, they didn't want to um, receive him back because they thought that um, he was good for nothing. And even with these stories in my mind, I, I still wanted to see what was out there. I still wanted to see what was out there in Europe. So after my bachelor's degree, I moved to Germany to further my education. But when I, were, when I was in Germany, I was kind of shocked with the life that I saw out there. Because the, the picture that was painted in my mind and what I thought of wasn't the life that the Ghanaians out there were living. So the, the actual idea started from these two um, moments that have happened in my life. So why this project? The idea of this project was to educate Ghanaians who are at risk of these kind of misconceptions and they try to risk their lives through, the, through, um, through Libya, the Mediterranean, and they end up on the shores of Europe. And even with this, we often hear the issues of brain drain and brain gain, brain, uh, brain gain but there is one, uh, there is one other um, aspect that we have, we have actually not looked at, which is brain loss. And the second um, was we organized these seminars. So the first is we trained facilitators to, um, in order to engage people in these kind of trainings. And we were to, because of our limited resources, we plan to only um, organize eight seminars here in Accra and also in Kumasi. Because of our resources, again, we couldn't go to the other um, sectors, other regions in Ghana. And the third was to also talk to religious leaders, we organize a religious um, workshop so that we can work with religious leaders on how they can counsel um, the people who are returning as well as people who are looking to travel. The third was engage the key stakeholders that we have here, create some kind of platform where we can all collaborate and work together. And the third was we produce a, um, a documentary in Germany where people living in Germany I'm talking about the lives and as well as the challenges that they have there and we shall show the trailer today by the close of the day. And if the media would like to engage with, um, engage with us, we are ready to make the documentary available so that they can also show on their various platforms. Hello everyone. <laughs> Representative of the Ghana Immigration Service, the International Organization for Migration, Center for International Migration, Madia Muslim Mission, the German Savings Bank, Ghana Union Hamburg, distinguished religious leaders present, um, meet our representatives, our protocols to be observed. I'm really happy um, to talk briefly about Speech Process, the organization that has been in charge of um, implementing the project here in Ghana. Um, so Speech Process started off as a group of young, enthusiastic people that were interested in debating and were willing to spread the love of debating across um, the communities. We are happy to have worked with Ghana Union Hamburg and the Center for International Migration on this project. For us, it's not just any project, it's about empowering young people and also shaping the narrative of the larger society of what life means in Europe. Project Mobile, Made for Better Life in Europe, aims at telling the untold stories, as Felix mentioned, about what life is in Europe, what generally people do not know, and what we have been made to believe as we were growing up. 
the project involved um, a lot of youth, religious leaders, various stakeholders in migration, through migration seminars, religious leaders conference, and migration stakeholders conference, respectively. The migration seminars aimed at engaging the youth directly, taking them through simulation exercises, so that they could better appreciate the challenges of what it means to move out of their country to Europe through the irregular means. The Religious Leaders Conference was aimed at bringing together various religious leaders and taking them through these workshops so that in their respective um, backgrounds or in their respective communities, they can be able to provide the requisite counseling or the yes, appropriate counseling to many young people that they come into contact with. As we draw the curtains to the end of this project, we're excited about the many people we have engaged and we are hopeful that in their respective communities they would share the stories and their learnings from the workshops, simulation exercises and their interaction with us in order for them, for us to see the kind of change we want. We are also hopeful that at the end of this conference, we would be able to identify measures that we can work together on um, to ensure safe migration and also help um, returnees in reintegrating as well as address the issues of stigmatization when it comes to return migrants. On behalf of Speech Forces and the entire team, I appreciate the unflinching support from our partners, Ghana Hampik, Union Hampik, Center for International Migration, the Ghanaian German Center for Jobs, Migration, and Reintegration, and every other person I couldn't mention for the help they have given to us in making sure that this project becomes a success. Good morning, everybody. Uh, the Deputy CEO of the National Youth Authority, Heads of Religious Bodies and CEOs here present, President of the Ghana Union Humble, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, all good also said. I'm honored to be part of this noble gathering of the Migration Stakeholders Conference 2020 and bring you warm greetings from the General Development Corporation GIZ program Migration and Diaspora here in Ghana. I stand here on behalf of the head of the program Migration and Diaspora BND Ghana, who duty due to other pressing engagements couldn't be here physically. Program Migration and Diaspora, a GIZ global program, is implemented through three components in 22 different countries. These are regular labor migration and mobility, diaspora cooperation, and migration governance. As a German government implementing organization and on behalf of the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, PMC, the GIZ PMD's diaspora cooperation component supports diaspora engagement as a way of mobilizing the diaspora to contribute to national development of countries of origin. There are about 20,000 diaspora organizations in Germany working to strengthen cultural cohesion and exchange through various non-profit activities. Many of these organizations are also involved in development-oriented projects in origin countries, and they contribute actively to sustainable development at the local level. Such diaspora organizations facilitate the exchange of knowledge between their old and new homes, they foster innovation, and also help improve living conditions of local people. And Ghana's example is what we are witnessing here today. The diaspora organization, Ghana Union Homework, and its partner organization here in Ghana, Speech Forces, is one of such diaspora organization partner countries, collaboration that contributes to migration management and migration development in Ghana. The GIZ program Migration and Diaspora, working on behalf of the German government, are supporting such a good cause through a diaspora organization grant for on-the-ground development-oriented project implementation. And ladies and gentlemen, undoubtedly, a fully engaged diaspora is vital in leveraging the potentials of mig migration for host and destination countries. Migration potential leveraging and partner capacity development is the objective of the program Migration and Diaspora, which is implemented by GIZ Plan. 
a solution-based approach towards effective diaspora cooperation for sustainable development remains key, and it is said that a well-managed migration yields numerous benefits for sustainable development. What the government on its side has done over the years to ensure that there is shared growth, shared prosperity, and opportunity for young people in a way that will reduce the exodus of young people seeking migration at all costs, which leads to all the challenges that we all know about. And so to do that for us, ladies and gentlemen, Mrs. Akusia Asan Menu, she is the Deputy Chief Executive Officer for the National Youth Authority. Please put your hands together for her as she joins us here to tell us what has been done so far from their side. The parents are happy because they have created something magical. But more importantly, they know within their power lies the ability to create just about anything from their special gift. That potential, however, could be positive or tragic. The difference between creating an invaluable member of the society and creating a valueless contribution to society is nurturing. They know that with nurturing, they can turn their child into something meaningful. That's why parents invest so much in educating, loving, reproaching, and spending time with their kids. Just like every parent, Ghana and indeed all of Africa have joy of having a youthful population. Like every new parent, we are tasked with a beautiful responsibility of nurturing them into a secure and prosperous nation. The National Youth Authority was established by an Act of Parliament to be an instrument of nurture for the nation's youth. In the past four years, the nurturing job has taken much more meaning under the leadership of His Excellency, Nana Adudam Kwaikufuadu, whose leadership at its core believes in investing in young people and creating better opportunities for them. The authority under the Act is mandated to A develop the creative potential of the youth, B, develop a dynamic and disciplined youth imbued with a spirit of nationalism, patriotism, and a sense of propriety and civic responsibility, and C, ensure the effective participation of the youth in the development of the country. With this focus, the National Youth Authority in the last four years, under the auspices of the Ministry of Youth and Sports, initiated four broad themes for nurturing the youth to play their role in nation building. These are economic empowerment, empowerment and entrepreneurial development, governance and leadership, international youth network and leadership, infrastructural projects and logistical support. Under the sphere of economic empowerment and entrepreneurial development, young people have benefited from job skills training so they can pursue their own livelihoods. These trainings have spanned online, digital marketing, branding, agriculture, app development, and street light installation and repairs. Young people have been supported with $80,000 and in kind support to start their businesses after such trainings. Over 15,000 beneficiaries are estimated to benefit from these initiatives and projects. In the area of governance and leadership, there has been the setting up of a district youth parliament where young people from across the political divide can share their views, their ideas, and learn civic engagement for contributing to nation development. There has also been the setting up of youth volunteer work camps. This was done with a view to instill in the youth patriotism, cohesion, integration, and skills for community development. Under the three modules implemented, youth beneficiaries have put up communal development projects spanning classroom blocks to community healthcare facilities. To equip our youth with the international ideas and engagement, the authority has also facilitated the international youth networking and leadership program. This has seen the hosting on various youth-oriented international events and conferences here in Ghana. To capture more youth than those who are unable to make such events, the authority, in partnership with the United Nations Development Program, UNDP, launched the Youth Connect Ghana platform to bring young Ghanaians and other young Africans across Africa 
together to share ideas on development on the continent. Infrastructure projects targeted at the youth has seen remarkable uptake in the past four years. 10 regional youth resource centers of excellence with a 5,000 seater capacity each at various stages of completion nationwide. I'm honored to be here today to share my story with you. Thank you to the organizers as well for giving me this opportunity. Um, so for the motivation, I was working with an organization. It was a very good organization, but I didn't have job satisfaction. I didn't like what I was doing. I always wanted to work in development cooperation, and I thought this was a good opportunity for me to build on that, to study something in development, and then come back and create a change. So I always wanted to have an impact in the world. That was what I thought at then, at that time. So to improve upon myself, um, tuition in Germany was free, so I thought it would be a good opportunity as well. And then I wanted the exposure. So I applied to schools um, in Ghana as well. And yes, yeah, so I prepared for the visa. I, I tried to get warm clothes because Germany is quite cold. And then, yes, I just, I just prepared for the trip. I downloaded an app to learn the language as well. But life in Germany wasn't all that rosy. There's so many opportunities, but you couldn't read it. You couldn't understand it. So you miss out on certain opportunities. So the language barrier had, had an effect because I wanted to, to work as well, but whenever I found a job, they, they said, you couldn't speak German, so we can't offer you this job. And then when you get there, they just shut the door on your face. When you get there, they tell you that it's not available anymore. Or you call people, when they hear your name, they just cut the line. If it was just left with the opportunities, I would be in Germany by now. I had wonderful opportunities. The networking was good. I was in an international class. And right now I can tell you that most of my mates are working with all these international organizations. So you can write to someone on LinkedIn and then they connect you to another person. The network was great, the experiences. I had the opportunity to intern at the UN for six months. It was a wonderful career start for me. After I completed uni, I decided going to Germany for my masters. So a friend introduced me to um, one connection man. He told me I can help out. But uh, before that, I wanted to be into this supplying aspect because after after my national service, I did. I did my national service at the um, hospital, so I wanted to supply them with the consumables and stuff. So I told a relative that he should support me with some finance. And she told me for that one, she can never afford. So when I went to the friend and he, he told me, this person can help you get a visa so that you go to Germany and do your master's. I went to him and he told me, if I have money, um, that time was uh, 350 million. I think for now it's uh, 35,000 or something. Uh, so I told a relative that this is what this person is saying. He said he can help out. So at that time, she has saved at um, this place. Uh, I don't know if you all heard of DKM or something. So she sent me to go for the money. But that's how I was lucky. So I went, I took the money, and I gave the money to this condition, as I'm saying. So he took us to Nigeria for our visa. And life at uh, Nigeria wasn't smooth for us because we were all desperate to go and do our masters. So, the visa was being issued to us. And then he told us the day that we were leaving to Germany. So he told us we should organize some monies because when they ask us, we should tell them we are going for holidays. So we'll be coming back. So we set off. 
we had our transit at uh, Turkey. They have, they also have some friends that when you are leaving, you go and meet them. Then they also help you in support of, to help you go to wherever you want to go. So we went to Turkey, and all my document was with him, and he gave me to a friend that he should take me to Germany. So when I get there, he help me out because they have some friends who can also help us get our masters. So when we go to Germany, I couldn't find a guy anymore. In fact, this burden, how am I going to take this burden away from me? It was very tough. So I stayed home for about uh, almost more than a year without a job. And they were calling me also for their money. So where do I get this money? She can help me get a document. So I should pay 9,000 euros for I can get the papers. So I told my auntie, that particular person who told me that, I was in the same church with her. When I'm here, she also be in front. Thank you to IOM and the Ghana Union Hamburg for also bringing us on board and uh, uh, for recognizing the work that we do. So we are, are well known for what we do in regards to reintegration of uh, ex-convicts with the absence of a non-custodial law in Ghana. Uh, we have decided that instead of people coming and going to steal a banana, going to steal cassava, and then being jailed, coming out of jail, and then going to steal again, we would reintegrate them. So for the past three years, we have reintegrated over 700, we have not only reintegrated, paid the fines of 742 inmates and then reintegrated most of them. But um, our introduction of the uh, CCS reintegration of migrants and returnees program uh, was in response to the numerous calls that we get from some of these uh, migrants. These are very chilling stories and at times you wonder why people who should have stayed at home no matter the circumstances should find themselves in countries treated like, uh, you know, animals and so on and so forth. We don't have much time, so just as I said, I don't want us to uh, go there. So what we do with regards to the reintegration of migrants and retaining program is, uh, we provide them counseling and livelihood support uh, so that at least they'll be able to do something uh, with their lives. As we speak, uh, there are many, many more, much as we are putting in place determined measures to ensure that they don't go. I can tell you that there are many more waiting in the wings wanting to go. Because of the rosy picture we continue to uh, project, it's rather unfortunate that uh, that has been the situation. We, we about uh, two months ago, uh, got another chilling story from Memun Amale. He went to Saudi Arabia, had an acid, acid accident. And uh, if you see him, you weep all because he has, she has to you know, put food on the table of uh, her family. Uh, just last week, we also uh, interviewed another one from Oman. And most of these people are from the Gulf uh, regions. And the, the, the uh, madam is supposed to pay her. She blatantly refused. And so she got ill and then uh, uh, had an injection. And then the next story is that she's mentally deranged. And then it took a, a philanthropist to uh, fly her back home. We are supporting her. So it is a tall order, and uh, I would want to use this uh, platform to appeal to donors who are supporting this uh, project uh, to extend, extend the publicity aspects to many parts of the country, to a larger target audience. Because it appears the rosy picture is still in the minds of many, most of these people who want to travel. Many people are not aware of these documentaries you are talking about. It is important that uh, you, you craft it in a way that will reach many, many people. Because it is not easy. We know that in the 80s and early 90s, you go abroad. I used to see some people coming in with 10 cars. But I'm not sure it's the same now. Uh, the first time I visited the US, uh, you know, after I had, you know, it, it, the place has been so much embellished that you would think that it is in the air. So when I went to Washington, I asked myself, so is this the 
the US data and you people are talking about because I had the impression that it is even hanging in the air. Um, even though I appear to be a bit literate. So you can imagine the number of people who are you know, unlettered uh, with this same perception. In the UK, it is where most, most of you are aware. It is not easy. And I visited my mother in the Netherlands and looking at where she stays, I asked, my, I, my, I asked myself so many questions. Why should we, you know? So um, it's rather unfortunate that the deputy CEO is not here. She cut a lot, lot of things that government has done, but I think that is not enough. There are so many innovative ways that successive governments, governments should be doing to ensure that people stay uh, in this country. People in the diaspora keep selling to us a story that is not true. A story that life is much better. A story of outside gentility and all that. We now look at a page that says that Penini, SFP, Emo, Akura, every Nanka, every Nanka, every Fawa, every Bay. Or come. So if the up to the traditional clergy or the traditional um, um, Muslim fraternity Orthodox do not um, do not engage in this in this discourse or do not condemn what the other clergy uh, other um, charismatic people are doing, then you continue to do. It's just um, it's it's a thing a thing on the religious image or the message that's coming from the religious fraternity. And back to the question that uh, you asked me. Let's say, I, 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 I mentioned the story of um, a guy I know who, is, who was a meditationalist in, in one of the second cycles too. He left um, the shores of Ghana and he found his, himself in Germany and now a cleaner. Because of the shame, because of the stigmatization, because of the fear that he feels that or, or the sense of being left out, he's being tempted to propagate false news. And when he comes here, he doesn't want to show. I, I, I feel that's the conversation and um, the, the messages that sometimes I get. They don't want to feel that um, the show that the friends here are doing better than them. So they are being tempted to yeah, be living a falsehood. Yeah, 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 they're, they're being, being tempted to live something um, a bigger life here. And I know, I know people, I know for sure, people were ready to come here. They borrow like 2,000 euros from their friends, 3,000 euros from their friends. They come, they rent, ish, um, 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 rent cars and try to live a bigger life. So we, the diaspora, as I said, we, f we feel now that we have been the cause of the problem too. And we are trying to engage this rhetoric and try to clarify that, hey, things are not that rosy here as you think. There are some challenges. And how can you deal with these challenges? Or how can you better find ways so that you wouldn't fall into this kind of trap? Especially in the past, we thought that all the Muslims are one. We now come to look at the you know, religious movements within the Muslim group. We have the idea, we have the Osuna, we have this and that. The same way people look at the Christians and they think that everybody is at the Christian council. And so they think that the Christian council has authority to you know, control everybody. That is not true. We are the Turkish Secretariat, we are the Christian council, we are the Ghana and the Costa council, we have the charismatic council and so on. And we have others who are not belonging to any of these groups. Now, the Christian council can only call to order where you belong to. The Catholic can, secretary can call to order when a Catholic priest misbehaves. Now, if somebody is an independent pastor, he's not under anybody. Regular migration and irregular migration. Right, so we have our two um, retainees sharing their experience and you can deduce from them that one went regularly and the other also through an agent. So now, after getting your passport yourself, you are applying for the visa yourself. And to our end, you will not come in contact with these people often because the only place that you engage them is when they visit 
the immigration at the airport, at the booth, and you want to travel. That is where you'll be able to detect that the visa that is in the passport is not genuine. So if you ask me the number of people that we've come in contact with, I can tell you a lot because we have a fraud office at the airport that are detecting most of these things. And when they detect, they will just put you aside, you know, to do further inquiries how you got these visas in the passport. So that is what I can say on that. And then more also, immigration does not prevent people from traveling. Yes, we have regular and irregular, as our people say. So we are preaching the regular means of traveling. Get these things done regularly so that you can travel regularly. If you tend to use other means to travel, you will go borrowing money as our brother did. He got to Germany and was stranded in Germany. Her sister also said that you can be here in Ghana, you can be working in Ghana and travel becomes very simple and easy for you. You will not suffer when you are going to the embassy to get your visa. You just get things done straight. So we are appealing and then we want to preach that, yes, you can travel to go and do one or two things, study for medical readings and other stuff, but let's use the right channel to travel. Because there are benefits in migrating regularly than choosing undocumented means of traveling. At the end, the finances that you even borrow from others, you find it very difficult to even repay some of these funds. So when you are able to empower the person, the person will not, you know, use the dependency theory. If you are able to empower somebody, the person will not use the modernization theory. Empowerment is the only thing that we need to do. And this stakeholders conference that we are hosting is one of the uh, one of the um, the, you know, the roadmap as to how to empower any person who intends traveling. Now you can see that it is not about people with the and unskilled labor that will travel, but semi skilled and skilled labor are traveling using the illegal route. So, what can we do? The media have to come in with such programs and then civil society organizations. And then we also have to plead with our, you know, Ghanaian residents who normally come for holidays to minimize the show off. Yes. You see, the show off is the problem. The show off, the show off, and the show off, you know, goes with a community honoring. If I live in a community whereby a neighbor, son, uncle, sister returned from anywhere, and you could see the show off. Why is it that when people travel and they have to return and they don't meet the expectations or the spirit is different, then if they come back home and we meet them with so much stigma. How well, we can tackle the, the issue? Yeah, it comes, it falls back to the people here in Ghana to have a meeting and, you know, uh, we could start by stop saying such things. Like, and then I'll divide, what can, what did you bring, you know? It, it all comes to that topic. So we could start by stopping those things we say and reach out more to them you know as in be more welcoming and help them um, start something you know irrespective of if they brought something or not mm. from where you are how many people have you encountered have had to deal with social stigma and what processes do they go through before they finally they finally open up and say look i need help help me how many have we encountered? Um, I mean, a number of. <laughs> I mean, currently there is one guy who, who who wants to come, but he's also afraid of this kind of stigma. Yeah. So you know, everybody that approach got the union. It's like hmm, most of them have everything, you know. But it takes courage um, to take the final decision to do so. 
So everybody who approaches us is like having this kind of stigmatization in the back of the head. But then it's an individual decision that eventually leads them to, to come back home. You know. So it, I would say all of them that came back through the union had this stigmatization at the back of the head. And we also faced uh, sometimes some critics because we we uh, were obviously working with the Libyan government there and everybody knows that the facilities that are run there are not all obviously up to the standard and uh, people are suffering really a lot in there. But uh, our standpoint was always uh, it is better to be on the ground and to interact with the stakeholders over there to try and make a difference. And so we are running these uh, humanitarian evacuation projects for several years now, where we um, going trying to get access to all these facilities. And what we do, we try to speak with people and see if they do voluntarily want to come back to their country of origin. And if they do, we evacuate them usually to uh, Niger. Quite close to this issue of migration in many ways. I have been to Europe a number of times, and I remember the last time I was in London, I met a few of our, our, our close relatives, and their look communicated to me without any shade of doubt that to even organize a ticket and come back home will be a problem for them. This is the issue of integration that we're talking about. To organize a ticket and come back home will be a problem for them. So if a ticket will be a problem. Supposing they are finally able to come, where are they going to, where are they going to stay? What job are they going to do? How are they going to live? These are issues that we need to address seriously. Because already those of us who are here, we are struggling with rents. Exactly. We are, we are already, our feet is not too much on the ground yet. We are still struggling to get our feet on the ground. And we meet people like us. So to get the issue of integration going, I will want to say something. Um, Ghanaians are very religious people. 90% class of Ghanaians belong to one church or one mosque. Now, if sermons on the issue of stigmatization and the need to re get them reintegrated back into society can be delivered in all our mosques and all our churches, by the time you are two, three, of such sermons, I believe every Ghanaian would have got in the meeting. Even those that are not neither Christian nor Muslim, open discussions in among their friends and whatnot will get the message across to them. So this is one very good starting point. In Ghana, matters of this nature are more difficult if you can organize them well. Our churches and our mosques, if we are serious about taking advantage of them, we will always be able to get these messages across. And I think it will a lot of so all the distress they come back home. What's the laid down procedure in helping them reintegrate? Is there anything like that? Normally, we get their data on returnees. Um, and the data that we take from them is their address, their telephone numbers, maybe next of kin, and the regions they live, the communities that they live. And along the line, some of the some NGOs wrote to Ghana Immigration Service, trying to have data of this report that they can follow up to help them. And actually, our we are just like a pivot of the retainees and then the organizations, the NGOs. So at the airport, normally we try to interview them, know some of the problems, how they even got to the place at the first place, because we have migration information uh, bureau. Normally, this uh, uh, some of the problems we we'll get from them, they will try to give you to the OIC who is in charge of migration information you know, and it's maybe uh, a sensitization. It's been a very productive and engaging session we've had today, and I'm sure you can all agree to that. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank each and every one of you distinguished guests for not only recognizing the essence of why we are here, but also taking time out of your day to come and attend this program and set our invitation. We are also especially grateful for our panelists who have led us in such an engaging discussion. 
and the religious leaders who were able to attend from various Muslim and Christian groups. We're also grateful to the government officials and also civil society groups as well as media personnel and everyone else. A heartfelt thanks to the partners, the Federation Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, the Center for International Migration and Development, and GIST Project Migration and Diaspora. All this would surely have not been possible without your help, seriously. Um, lastly, I would love to give a special thank you to the team behind this event. These guys have been nothing short of, short of amazing and it's been an absolute pleasure working with every one of you. Yes, my name is Jennifer and thank you guys for coming. <laughs> Yeah.